What's up, Meta Nerds? We'll be pulling from every source available to break down the Lancer class frigate, the ship that could have saved the Empire, but just ended up proving how inept they were. The Lancer class frigate, manufactured by the renowned Kuat Drive Yards, is an exemplary model of starship design, tailored specifically for anti starfighter warfare. With a cost of 4,760,000 credits, it's a significant investment, equal to much larger ships, but you'll see how its capabilities and features justify the expense. Measuring 250 meters in length, 57 meters in width, and 60 meters in height, it's a sizable vessel designed to operate as a part of larger fleets or as an independent platform for starfighter defense. Its size allows it to accommodate a considerable amount of tech, weaponry, and crew, giving it a formidable presence in any engagement. Its propulsion system allows for a maximum acceleration of 4 megalite per second, reaching a top speed of around 20 megalite. While this speed may not compare to the swifter T-65 X-Wing or TIE Fighters, which can reach 100 megalite per hour, the Lancer is not primarily designed for speed. Its role is more focused on providing anti-starfighter support and is meant to stay with the larger and slower capital ships. And if you're wondering how top speed in space makes any sense, don't think about it too much. Just chalk it up to resistance from colliding into midichlorians, floating their way through space on their way to the next hero to provide plot armor. It's equipped with a hyperdrive, and some models have a class 1, while others are fitted with a class 2, along with a backup class 15. This variation allows for flexibility in deployment, having fleets that are all in the same class of hyperdrive, that way they can more quickly respond to emerging threats. Pairing class 1s with other larger class 1 capital ships. Its shielding is rated at 576 SBD, or Shield Barrier Density, providing robust protection against enemy fire. Its hull is equally sturdy, rated at 304 RUs, or resistance units, ensuring the vessel can withstand significant damage even after that shield goes down. It comes with a standard navigation computer, essential for precise calculations required for hyperspace jumps and in-system maneuvers. But its most notable feature is its armament. 20 Point Defense AG-2G Quad Laser Cannons. That's 80 individual Point Defense Cannons in total, and they're all strategically distributed across the hull. Five quads each at the four port, starboard, and aft sections. Some of these cannons are capable of retracting into the main hull, and reducing the frigate's profile in combat or when traveling. Point Defense Cannons are crucial for defending against Starfighter assaults and incoming missiles, making the Lancer class an essential asset in protecting larger capital ships and convoys. The Lancer also houses a complement of two shuttles, enhancing its operational flexibility, whether for deploying troops, conducting reconnaissance missions, or shuttling cargo and VIPs. The crew requirements were substantial, with a standard crew of 810, including 40 gunners. However, the ship can operate with a minimum crew of 375, demonstrating the efficiencies of its systems and that it relies on some automation, something you'd think you'd see a lot more of in the galaxy far, far away. Additionally, it carries 40 troops as passengers, which does allow it to carry out its own very limited scope of operations. Though I can't stress this enough, and you'll see that the imps seem to forget this too, it was designed to be embedded in larger fleets. With a cargo capacity of 300 metric tons, a weight equal to 368 dubaks, we get the funny stat that it provides consumables lasting from one week to six months. I guess that just depends on their discipline, as that's a 24x difference. But if we assume six months of Jawa jerky supplies, you can see that it's well equipped for extended deployments, capable of sustaining its crew and operations for considerable periods without resupply. And if the larger fleet that it was escorting was out for longer than this, then it could use those shuttles to ferry supplies from the larger ships like ISDs. But with that focus on point defense, removing the threat of starfighters, it played one of the most vital roles in fleet compositions. The combo of firepower, respectable shields, and operational flexibility made it a valuable asset in any galactic conflict, proving again why Kuat has been king since the time of the Old Republic, producing high-quality, specialized starships for diverse needs. The surest pick for your stock portfolio, and the only ones that ever win these galactic wars. But taking a look at the schematic, we can look at the bow to see the dual decks, with the top one being the computer and sensor control bridge, while the main bridge with pilots, gunners, and the ship's commanders is located below. Right behind the bridge, we see the main deflector shield projector, a smart location for maximal strength around your nerve center, and even your docking port, which is located right above. This is a really unique spot to put a port. It might look normal-ish for many ships, but could be a very odd sight with others, having a ship sticking right out of its head, as it were while well, the internal hangar bay is down below. And here you can see the retracted cannon, and moving over the dorsal side we hit the sensors, with these larger dishes mirrored on the top and bottom being the targeting computer array. This device is not described, perhaps it's some top secret Kuat creation, but it's not in all models, and thus could be a part of those with a much faster class 1 hyperdrive system, either in the unit itself or a radiator to shed heat. 
or it could just be another form of sensor array, making sure they get the max use out of their anti-starfighter weaponry, with tracking multiple nimble fighters requiring a lot more data and calculation than just heavy turbo laser cannons on capital ships slugging it out. Let's pause and thank this video's sponsor, Exter Wallets. The Exter Wallet is a perfect gift this holiday season. They're running a huge sale, and using code METANERDS, you're gonna get 55% off. What I have right here is the Parliament model. It's made of high quality vegan Italian leather. It's super slim, half the size of a conventional wallet that can hold up to 12 cards. And the really interesting thing is this trigger mechanism feature, which, bam, allows you to get easy access to all your cards while still keeping a slim profile. It has built-in RFID blocking technology so nobody can walk by and skim your cards. What's really neat is that on the back there's a space for this little tracker. It has a little solar panel here and it allows you to use your phone to find your wallet or if you have your wallet, you can press a button on here to chirp your phone. Pretty cool. Be sure to check out the extra wallets. I got the link down in the description. You get an extra 55% off Again, what I have here is the Parliament in Terracotta. They have a ton of other colors and other types of wallets and other products. I'm sure you're gonna like them. Now these large bulbous ovals are not shield projectors, but power storage capacitor bays, showing the enormous energy generated for all those weapons, respectable hyperdrive, and this massive quad assembly of ion thrusters. With this unit here being the overload chamber to help control and vent any dangerous fluctuations, especially when the system was under attack. With these energy storing systems being hit by ion weaponry and the downstream effects of this damage, while still trying to generate energy and return fire, navigate through the space battle and dense asteroid fields or debris clouds. The earliest iteration of the Lancer class was first deployed a few months after the conclusion of the Clone Wars. During this period, Imperial Starship strategy predominantly focused on ship-to-ship -ship combat, hunting down CIS warlord holdovers that might have an odd requisite or munificent but since Vader shut things down on Mustafar, the threat of droid fighters was essentially removed, and they weren't worried about the threat posed by smaller, more agile starfighters, just making sure they took out these old capital ships. This oversight became particularly evident as the Rebel Alliance pilots began exploiting the weakness of larger star destroyers, a phenomenon colloquially referred to as trench run disease. It's risky, but flying fast and close to the star destroyer's hull should get us to the other side safely. Hold. This is one of the most useful tactics in the Rebels' strategy, flipping the Tarkin Doctrine on its head, not being afraid of the much larger ships, but using their bulk against them. Pilots executing the TRD would fly close to the surface of a large ship, using its hull trenches to shield themselves from enemy fire. These trenches, designed for structural purposes rather than combat, provided unintended cover for the nimble fighters. By hugging the ship's surface, very few guns could actually fire at them, and those that could were all heavy turbo laser cannons, which were primarily designed for ship-to-ship -ship combat. Big, massive bolts but would never be accurate enough or fire fast enough to hit these fast-moving targets like snub fighters. The effectiveness of this approach was enhanced when starfighters were armed with heavy ordnance like proton torpedoes and concussion missiles. They could perform surgical strikes, hitting a key area and maybe if it didn't take out the entire ship, it at least immobilized it and took it out of the fight for months if not longer while the rebels carried on with their main objective. Of course, the most successful application of the TRD was during the Battle of Yavin, and the Imperial Navy's response involved two key strategies. The acceleration of production and deployment of the TIE Interceptor, which was faster and more agile than its predecessors, and the development of the Lancer-class frigate. It was specifically designed as an escort ship to counter screens of starfighters, with hopes of shutting down this TRD tactic. Though the fast-moving rebel opportunists did find ways to still use it, most notably in the assault on the Fondor shipyards. Stay toward the middle of those structures and keep low. Most of their guns can't hit you there. And of course, again during the Battle of Endor. By targeting sites that were under construction, or the enormous Executor-class ships, they still applied the TRD to deadly effect. Commander Wedge Antilles, reflecting on the first battle of Borlaeus, noted that while the actual success rate of snub fighters destroying an ISD was relatively low, the psychological impact of the Death Star's destruction had instilled a deep-seated fear of this tactic among the Imperial commanders. Rogue Squadron got so good at this tactic that they were able to maneuver around the defenses of the Lasankia, a super star destroyer, and using their advanced targeting systems to guide heavy salvos of torpedoes and missiles into the enemy ship. This tactic usually involved a triangular three-ship formation, with the two rear fighters protecting the lead fighter, which was the one equipped with the most potent weaponry. This formation allowed the lead fighter to focus on targeting, while the others provided cover by absorbing incoming fire, and hopefully firing back and taking out the enemy. 
It was Admiral Andres that proposed the use of Lancer-class frigates to counter enemy fighters, showing that it was the missing piece that would allow the more dominant Star Destroyers to focus on larger ship-to-ship -ship engagements. And while the Imperial Navy Command approved this strategy, it was often considered to be the most effective creation of the Imperial military. Still, they were literally overshadowed by the grand projects like Super Star Destroyers and Exotic Planet Killers. If you thought the imps couldn't get any dumber, of course, the Lancer-class design sacrificed capital-grade weaponry and shielding. It was supposed to be embedded in a fleet, but this meant that it was vulnerable to other capital ships. Again, their slow speed was because they were escorting the ISDs, capital ships that could be packed full of TIE interceptors, and so without them, there was no way to pursue the faster starfighters. When the Empire sent the Lancer-class out on its own, the Rebel pilots could just avoid it. With high construction cost and substantial crew requirements, the Imperial Starfleet deemed the Lancer class too expensive for widespread fleet integration. And so many of the ones that were produced were relegated to roles in planetary defense, rear guard operations, and anti-piracy patrols, particularly in the Outer Rim territories. You could imagine how this would have driven Grand Admiral Thrawn insane. As petty moths and regional bureaucrats were sending Lancer-class frigates on wild goose chases hunting down local pirates, putting them on offense, and while those used on defense to guard operations like spaceports or some planet-side bases could be easily taken out by the growing number of capital ships in the Rebel Alliance. As Alderaan made sure that ships kept being stolen by rebels, with amazing Corellian designs falling into their hands, not to mention all the Mon Cala capital ships. All the Rebels had to do was locate a Lancer, either through local intel or even having starfighters just observe them at a distance, being smart enough not to engage, just report back to one of their capital ships, who could pop out of hyperspace right on top of the thing, harmlessly absorb all the point defense laser cannon fire. As there was absolutely no risk of point defense cannons overwhelming something like Mon Cala capital ship shield generators, and so in a few salvos the Lancer was blown into space debris. The strategic value of Lancer-class frigates was not fully realized until the rise of Grand Admiral Thrawn in 9 ABY. Even then, he used them in a unique way, knowing how to push them into a more offensive role, leading quick, raiding missions against key New Republic worlds, but only because he knew that the New Republic was using starfighter-based defenses. So it was like the reverse of what the Rebels were successfully doing to the Empire. If you knew that a cloud of X-Wings was all that was protecting some outpost, now the Lancer could be the one to pop out of hyperspace right on top of them, blow the X-Wings to bits, or scare them off while the shuttles go down and carry out the objective while being smart enough to quickly retreat through hyperspace before the New Republic capital ships could respond. As the Empire waned and the New Republic gained ascendancy, defeating the remaining Imperial warlords, several of the Lancers fell into the hands of the New Republic defense fleet and were integrated into planetary defense fleets, though most were set to be decommissioned. Even then, it did influence the development of the New Republic's Ranger-class gunship, making sure they had a ship specialized for an anti-starfighter role. One of the most notable uses during this era was in Morith Duel's defense of Kessel, utilizing two Lancer-class frigates. And during the Yuzon Vong War, the NR recommissioned many of their Lancers, finding these anti-starfighter capabilities invaluable against the Yuzong Vong's coral skippers. As you can see throughout its long service history, it really evolves from an underutilized asset to a key component at various times when used correctly under leaders from the Imperial Era, Imperial Remnant, and New Republic forces. And approximately three decades after the Battle of Endor, it found new life and purpose within the First Order. In this period of Cold War, as Leia was monitoring the rise of something in the Unknown Regions, Commander Poe Dameron made a significant discovery of two Lancer-class frigates being under the control of this mysterious new military force. Rising from the ashes of the Galactic Empire, they leveraged existing military assets, and hoping not to repeat the failures over Yavin and Endor, they wanted to make sure they had anti-starfighter capabilities. And when Poe discovered these, it was not just a frightening revelation for the Resistance as a whole, but very personal for him as a fighter pilot. Though, of course, those midichlorians did find their heroes and adorn them in the proper plot armor, making sure to negate the effect of these Lancers. As for behind-the-scenes facts, there are a lot of design similarities with the Carrick and Dreadnought, but all three of these ships come from different manufacturers, so this might point at some degree of corporate espionage or just flat-out imitation. The Lancer, produced by Kuat Drive Yards, for the anti-starfighter role were the Carrick class light cruiser designed by Demorian Manufacturing Corporation and the Dreadnought class heavy cruiser from Rendili Star Drive play a more standard capital ship role. It would be a very silly looking fleet, but really these three would be paired excellently, each having unique roles and characteristics. 
We get the story of Poe finding them in the 2015 novel, Before the Awakening, written by Greg Rucka, and this is how it comes back into the new canon. All the more detailed original canon or legends history was first mentioned in the Star Wars Rules Companion, and made its first appearance in the novel Dark Force Rising. The schematics and technical details fleshed out in the Essential Guide to Vehicles and Vessels, as well as the Age of Rebellion core rulebook. You can also check out Starships of the Galaxy in the Imperial Sourcebook to learn more. Make sure you head over to Fractal Sponge, it's where you get a lot of these magnificent renders. I'm sure a lot of you guys have already been there, but I had to make sure to mention it. There's truly a ton of amazing things on there. If you made it this far, please hit that like button, and check out these videos, I'm sure you'll like them. But most important of all, remember, no ship's stat is stronger than the plot, and the force to be with you, always.